you know that some ancient Romans' homes were fitted with a type of air conditioning? It's true. Some Roman homes had a network of pipes built into the wall so that during the hot summer months, cold aqueduct water could be pumped through these pipes, cooling the interior temperature of the house. This was an effective early form of air conditioning, although it must be noted only the rich elite of ancient Rome could afford it. Hello, hello to you Tenfolders. Welcome to another exciting edition of Tenfold Live. My name is Sibu Siso, and like I always say, I'm very excited to be with you on another eye-opening edition of Tenfold Live on the show that is proudly brought to you with lots of love by Liberty. A very special shout out always goes out to Liberty for affording us this opportunity to share all this awesome content that we're going to be sharing with you as we'll be revising Mathematics Paper 1, focusing specifically on the harder and more challenging questions. Remember, like we always encourage you, if you want 
access to all the resources that will help you build yourself up, such as videos that give you lessons, that give you all the basics. Go to your app store and look for what we call the Tenfold Education app. It's an awesome app packed with a lot of very useful resources that will also assist you guys to stream this show live. Perhaps you also want access to more resources for practice purposes. It's exam time, so maybe you want those, go to WhatsApp. Just drop us a message. And the number that's currently appearing on your screen will then hook you up with all those resources. There's decks there, also waiting with a lot of very useful resources. Beyond that, perhaps you want access to videos that will help you see more of what we're doing. Go to YouTube, Mindset Learn. That's what we are, if you get there. Um, like all those videos that we have there, share them with all your friends and encourage as many people to go and watch all those videos. I promise you they will help you as you go through all the material that you have to worry about trying to help yourself to basically be ready for the upcoming end of the year exams. Like I said, on today's program, we're focusing specifically on mathematics revision. We'll be looking on paper one and most importantly focusing on the more harder sections and the more harder questions of any topic that you could find interesting. And you guys are the ones who are sending us questions via Facebook or even via our app. Thank you very much for sending them. Please send them through as you're watching the program. We might also take your question and use it to try and help more of you guys to understand how do you work with these concepts. So you don't want to miss this edition. It's going to be a very exciting one. Go to your WhatsApp as well and inform all your friends who are not watching that they're going to miss out if you're not, they're not watching uh, today's program. So without any further waste of time, I'm very excited to start with our first question. This one was sent to us by Oma. Let's go and check it out. All right. So this one, like I said, comes from Oma Habimana. It's basically a question that is based on sequence sensors. This is one section that a lot of people know. It's very simple, but I promise you what you're going to see from Oma's question is something that you probably haven't thought about. That the fact that we can complicate uh, something as simple as a quadratic sequence. So question two reads as follows. It says, the pth term of the first differences of a quadratic sequence is given by tp equals 3p minus 2. 2.1, 2 determine between which two consecutive terms of the quadratic sequence the first difference is equal to 1,450, right? Now, this can be very complicated, grade 12. It can be very complicated, particularly if you don't understand the difference between what a quadratic pattern is and what it is its first difference. So what I normally do when I get these kinds of questions, which we call problem-solving questions, they're not really straightforward. There's a lot of thinking involved when you try to work with a question such as this one. So always move yourself back to what you traditionally do when you're working with what we call a quadratic pattern. So my approach is going to be, okay, we know this is about a quadratic pattern somehow. We don't know what the terms of the quadratic sequence are going to be. Let me try and build boxes here to try and see what does this quadratic sequence have anything to do with this TP formula that was given to us over here. So a traditional quadratic pattern will have terms. There's gonna be a term that you have here. You will have another term here. These are the terms of the original pattern, right? I'll just put them here nicely. And maybe let's put one more here on the left. You can obviously have as many of them as possible. The general formula for these guys is always given by Tn equals to An squared plus Bn plus C. We know that this is a quadratic formula for any pattern that is quadratic. Now, the beauty about this is once you start taking the first differences, you're going to get a series of terms, which are terms of the first difference of a quadratic pattern, right? Very interesting stuff, okay? Now, if you continue, you will notice that this also has its own difference. The difference that comes, which we call the second difference, is what we call the second difference of the quadratic pattern always produces a number that happens to be the same. So if you go back and you check what we have, you'll agree with me that the general formula of what you get here, which is the terms of the first difference, always produces something that is in the form an plus b. It's basically a linear pattern, which is also known as an arithmetic pattern. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but the terms you get, the first difference terms of a quadratic, always form an arithmetic pattern. Very important for us to keep that in mind. The second difference, we all know that it's going to be the same. Now, we do not know what the terms of the original pattern are, but we know for the first difference, even though we don't know the terms, 
we know the formula that defines them. It was expressed in terms of P. Where you see P, you can think of this as something similar to Tn equals to 3n minus 2. Now, I can be able to produce the terms that I want for the first difference if I use that formula of 3n minus 2. For example, if I substitute 1 there, I'll have 3 times 1 minus 2, and that beautiful people will produce the first term of the first difference, which means we'll have a 1 here. If I put a 2 in this formula, if I sub 2, I'm going to get 3 times 2, which is 6. If you take 2 away from 6, you're going to get a 4 here. And if I put 3 there, I'll get 3 times 3, which is 9. Take away 2 from 9, you're going to have a 7. You'll notice that our quadratic pattern has a first difference of the terms 1, 4, and 7. If you take the difference between those, you're going to have the number 3. And if you take the difference between these, you're also going to have the number 3. I was expecting this 3 because it is the gradient of your... Uh, Tn equals to 3n minus 2 equation. Very important for you to see that. It tells you they are growing by how much. The terms of the first difference are growing by 3. So very important. Now, what does the examiner want? The examiner says, we know what you said to us about the formula for the quadratic pattern. Let's just try and pack that by, let's remove it. If you remove that, um, we're going to have something interesting. Let's just try and find out what they want us to say. They say, if you continue these two patterns that you have, the linear, and the quadratic pattern. There's two terms that you're going to have somewhere later. There's a term here and the term after it. When you take the difference between these terms, these two terms, you're going to get a number here. And that number is going to be 1,450. So you're going to have 1,450 as the difference between two subsequent terms of the quadratic term. We don't know it is which term and which term that comes after it. So those two terms that follow each other, when you get the difference between them, you're going to get 1,450. And it's clearly indicated in the sta statement. Determine between which two terms of the quadratic sequence, the first difference is equal to 1,450. Now, luckily, we know the formula for the terms that are of the first difference. So we can try and use that to try and figure out what is the um, value going to be? What's the value of n going to be? So I'm basically trying to figure out at what position of the first differences is 8,450 going to be located. So if you take the general term, which is three, they wrote it as 3p minus 2, all right? Like I said, the p stands for the position. We can actually continue and equate that to 1,450. What we're trying to do is we're trying to effectively figure out at what position, which is indicated by p in this formula, will we get 1,450? That actually gives you 3p equals to 1,450. 52. You divide both sides by 3. If you take that 1,452 and you divide it by 3, you're always going to get a number that in this case comes up as 484. That's what I'm getting. So that means that 1,450 is at position 484 of these guys, of the linear pattern. Now, let's compare between the original pattern and the first difference. You'll notice that the first term of the first difference comes from term number one and term number two. So between n is one and n is two. So when you take n of two and term two minus term one, you're going to get the first term of these guys. When you take the difference between the third term and the second term, you're gonna get the second term of this one. I don't know if you can see the difference here. Term one of these ones, term two of these ones comes from three and two, and then obviously term three of these ones come from the difference of term four and term three. You're gonna get the third one of these guys. Now, if this one is at 4, 8, 4, where is it coming from? It's clearly between term number 4, 8, 4 and term number 4, 8, 5. So that's definitely going to be the answer there. I'm sure you guys can see the connection because if you look, you, you'll see that the first term comes from the first term and the second term. The second term comes from the second term and the third term. So clearly, the 484th term will come from term 484 and term 485. So that will be our solution between T485 and T484. And that's the solution we're looking for. Good. Okay, the second part of this says the 40th term of the quadratic sequence is 2290. All right, let's go and map that so that you guys can see what is going on. What do we know so far? We don't know the terms. We don't know the first term here. We don't know the second term. We don't know the third term. But we know later 
there's going to be a term on this pattern, according to the examiner, that is at position 40. At position 40, the 40th term of the quadratic is 2,290, okay? And the formula is given to us as Tn is An squared plus Bn plus C. Notice we don't know what A is, we don't know what B is, we don't know what C is, so this is a mess. The nth term of the quadratic sequence, calculate the value of C. So we are interested in finding the value of C. So let's continue mapping this the way we normally work with the quadratic pattern. We're looking for the differences between subsequent terms. We know from what we have above that the first term is going to be 1, and the second term is going to be 4, and we obviously know the third term is going to be 7 because these guys have the formula Tp equals to 3p minus 2, which was given to us. Now, a quadratic pattern continues and has what you call the second difference, the difference which is going to come out as 3, right? So this is how you normally work with a general quadratic pattern. Now, how do we find the general term of a quadratic pattern? We always say 2a equals to whatever you have here. We then come and say 3a plus b equals to whatever you have here. And we say a plus b plus c is equal to what we're supposed to have here, which unfortunately we don't have, okay? So let's work out the value of a and the value of b. So if 2a equals to 3, okay, 2a equals to 3, then it means that our a is going to be 3 halves. And then the second part says 3a, which means uh, 3 times 3 halves plus b is going to give us a 1, okay? That's actually 9 over 2. So you're looking at b equals to 1 minus 9 over 2 when you subtract 9 over 2 on both sides of the equation. That's the same as 2 over 2 minus 9 over 2. It's going to basically give you negative 7 over 2. That's what you end up with if you think about what you have on um, our calculation of b there. All right, now the challenge is we would normally continue and say a plus b plus c equals to term 1 of the quadratic. Unfortunately, we don't know what term 1 is in our quadratic pattern, so we need to use something else. Now, let's go back and use what was given. We were told that the 40th term is 2290. That means I can substitute this 2290 as the t value and substitute n as 40 in the general quadratic term. That should help me to figure out what the value of c is going to be. So what do we have? We have a n squared, add with b n and c. Do we know a? Yes, we know what a is. Let's put it down. We just worked it out. It's three halves. Okay, so we've got three halves of n squared. We are a subtracting seven halves of n. We don't know what c is, and we've got tn. Now, that part that was given to us about the 40th term comes in here. That means I'm keeping my three halves. I need the position value. I'm keeping my seven halves. I need the position value. I don't know what c is. But what do I know? I know that the 40th term has a value 2,000 and 2,290. Okay, 2,290. So the substitution I have of the term value and the position will assist me to work out the value of A. And I'm sure you can see that the only variable that remains in our equation is just the value of C. So that means when you take 2,290, you subtract 3 over 2 into 40 squared, you add 7 over 2 into 40, you should have the value of C. And therefore, our C value is going to be, let's see what the answer is going to be. You call in your calculator, try and compute this. We've got 2, 2, uh, 9, 0. Subtract, what are we subtracting? 3 over 2, no, delete, backspace here. Uh, 3 halves, 3 over 2 uh, into, we've got 40. I'm sure this is just calculators work, uh, beautiful people, squared, and then we have to add. Remember that was minus on the right hand side, so on the left hand side it's going to appear as plus, right? Plus seven halves uh, of something very interesting. What is that? That's going to obviously be 40 because 40 tells us the position of the term we're looking for. And I'm ending up with the number 30 as our C value. And this is how you will work out the value of C, which you can then plug back to try and find what the general term of your quadratic pattern is going to be. I hope you now see the relationship between a quadratic pattern and its first difference which happens to be an arithmetic uh, sequence as well, which is very awesome and absolutely exciting. Thank you very much for sending us that question. There's still lots of very challenging questions coming. You want to see how to analyze those ones? Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Did you know that 1.3 million Earths could fit inside the Sun? While our Sun is only technically an average sized star, it is gigantic when compared to the Earth. The Earth's diameter is just under 12,800 kilometers, easily dwarfed by the 1,392,000 kilometer diameter of the Sun. The Sun is so big that about 1.3 million Earths could easily fit inside it. No one ever asks why we do the weird things we do. Like, why once is never enough? Or doing two trips is just one too many. Why do we, before we use these, or say five, when we mean twenty, why do we have second thoughts? And think that lift buttons make them go faster. Why don't we walk there, cross our fingers, touch wood, and struggle to hide our true feelings. At Liberty, we want to know all the weird and wonderful things that make us human. Because human beings, being human, are what we make financial solutions for. Liberty, in it with you. Welcome back, beautiful people, and thank you for staying with us. You are watching Ten for Live very proudly brought to you by Liberty Program, where we are just looking at the revision of Mathematics Paper 1. Like we always encourage you guys, if you haven't done so, go to your app store and look for our awesome app. Awesome app. It's called Tenfold Education, packed with a lot of very useful resources that have got all the basics that we're using as we're covering these complicated questions to help you understand how do you actually work with them, how do you deal with these things. Like we always say, perhaps you need more information, such as more work that you can use to practice. We have all that on WhatsApp. Send a text there. There's decks ready with all these resources. You'll use them and also practice with them to try and make sure that you're ready for the upcoming exams. Beyond that, we also have videos. As if that was not enough, go to YouTube. We also have you covered there. Look for the Mindset Learn channel. Like the videos and also subscribe there. Follow us, guys. We've got more stuff coming beyond what we're doing today. Remember, it's now time for revision towards exams. So we really want to make sure that when you guys have the time to practice, you have all that you need. Beyond that, if you keep watching the program, you will benefit enough so that when you have to write, you'll be ready, fully uh, ready with all that you need to know to make sure that you ace those exams because we're here for you guys. Send the questions if you meet them that are challenging you. You can also send them on Facebook. We are here. If you don't want to send them, using the app, which also allows you to send the question. Let's go and see the person who sent us the question is and what the question was basically uh, based on. Okay, so this one comes from Shizuke uh, Makese Mashila. Uh, it looks like it's a question that is based on a cubic graph. Absolutely awesome question. You want to wait and see the last question. I just took a, uh, a little bit of a, a, a look at this, and I feel like it's a very exciting question. It's packed with a lot of very exciting basics that you guys have to master for you to see how do you apply your knowledge of differential calculus to try and analyze a question such as this one. All right. It reads as follows. It says in the diagram, the graph of f of x equals negative 2x squared plus 6x, uh, negative 2x cubed, beg your pardon, plus 6x squared plus 18x plus 10, and g of x equals negative 2x plus 10 are drawn. Point P has coordinates 5 and 0, and S with coordinates negative 1 and 0 are points on the x-axis, and T is the y-intercept of F and G. So that means they've got a common y-intercept. All right. Uh, S and A are the turning points of F. F and G intersect at the point R with coordinates negative 2 and 14. Very awesome question. Great graphs. Drawn on the same set of axes. They look very intimidating. But this is Tenfold Life. We'll show you how to actually work with them and analyze this uh, awesome question. First question asks us to calculate the coordinate of A. All right, so how do you work that out? Go back to the drawing. Locate what A is. A is the turning point. And if A is a turning point, we know that at a turning point, the gradient of the graph is always equal to zero. So please pay attention to that. It means the graph is neither increasing nor decreasing. When a graph is increasing at this part, it has a positive gradient. This section, it has a gradient that is greater than zero. It means the derivative 
is positive. The graph is increasing. It has a gradient that is positive. When it gets to the turning point, because it moves from going up, it flattens up and becomes straight. It ceases to increase, it stops. So at the point where it stops, the gradient is going to be zero. And then after that, in this session, it starts to decrease. That means the gradient at that point will now start to be less than zero. But what do they want? They want the coordinates of A. So I'm just going to begin by finding the gradient and equating it to zero and solve for what x is going to be at that point, okay? So if you check our equation, it's negative 2x cubed plus 6x squared. So we know that the function is negative 2x cubed plus uh, 6x squared. We need to find the remaining two terms of our cubic function. They are basically positive 18x and 10. Okay, plus 18x plus 10. Let's find the gradient. Here's the gradient. I want to call it the gradient not the derivative, because it's important for you to keep that in mind, that this is a gradient. How do you work that out? Exponent times coefficient, exponent minus 1. Second term, exponent times coefficient is 12 when you multiply these two, and then from that you subtract the 1, you get x. 1 times 18 gives you 18. x minus, uh, on the 1 here, if you subtract the 1, you end up with a 0, so the 18 survives because it's going to be 18 times 1. The derivative of a constant is always equal to 0. Now, after working out the derivative, you need to equate it to zero and then solve for x. Now, when I look at all these little awesome numbers, they're all factors of six. So I can divide all of them by negative six. If you divide the first one by negative six, you're going to get x squared. If you divide this one by negative six, you're going to get negative two x. If you divide this one by negative six, you're going to get negative three equals to zero. Let's factorize this. We can take our chances. I knew that we could get factors because of something very awesome. Let's go back and make the connection. The point S is also a turning point, and it is what I call a bouncing point. Now, every time a graph bounces like this, it means that turning point is an x-intercept, and it's also um, a turning point. If you had to find the three factors of your cubic, there will always, always be that point twice. That means there's plus one twice, and then there's the third factor, which in our case, it's a five there. So I know that my third factor will be a five. I don't know what the A value is going to be. In this case, they told us that it is 2, and we can see, of course, we can steal it from this 2 that you have over there. I know that this is going to basically be your A value over there. But the point I wanted to make is if you've got a bouncing point like this, it means that is a repeating factor, and your repeating factor is always a turning point. So it makes it, when I'm trying to work out the turning point, I know that that 1 is also going to be uh, a participant here. So I'm expecting that plus 1 is going to be part of my factors there. Clearly, for me to get a negative 3, I just need to have a minus 3 here. And it turns out that this is an awesome factorization of what we have here. So from here, if you use the factor, zero factor law, you end up with x is negative 1, or x equals to positive 3, which is quite awesome. Okay, now I've got those. I'm looking for the corresponding y values. Clearly, I like I said, y is going to be 0 here. We already see this turning point. If you want to convince yourself, just substitute back into the original. You'll be able to see what the y value is going to be when you pluck back that value of uh, negative 1. If you look closely, you'll see that on the, the other point, we are looking for the y value when x is equal to 3. It's always very simple. As long as you remember that if you have an x-coordinate, you can always find the corresponding y coordinate by just plugging that x coordinate wherever you see x in the original equation. Make sure that you don't mess up your signs and all your numbers are always correct. And if you do that, everything else is going to be quite, quite uh, awesome. You'll see that if you sub it back, you end up with a y value of 64. So that means the coordinates of a, which is what they're asking for, will be uh, 3 and 64. And notice, you're plugging this back to the or original, the original equation, not the derivative. If you plug it back to the derivative, it will give you a zero. So that's the coordinates of A right over there. It's going to be exactly uh, 3 and positive 64. Now, we're going back to the second part here, and it says to us here we are looking for the equation of the tangent of F where X equals to positive 2. So what do we have? We've got a cubic graph that looks like this, right? it is going to be 2 at some point. If we're claiming that A has an x value of 3 and 64, it means 2 is going to be somewhere here. We're looking for the equation of the tangent. The tangent is going to be a straight line that touches our graph at one point. Okay. Now, we need to know what the coordinate of that point of contact is going to be. Please allow me to remove this A just to make it easier for you guys to see what is going on so that it's not confusing. 
Now, for us to be able to find the equation of a straight line, what are the ingredients? The ingredients are always going to be, you need to find the gradient at that point, and you always need to find the coordinate of the point of contact. Now, the point of contact will have an x value of 2, according to the examiner. It means x is 2 there. Now, what we need is to find the corresponding y value. Like we did with our A calculation, if you've got an x of 2, you can just steal it and go plug it in the original equation and try and find out what the x value is going to be. So take this 2, plug it into the equation. So y is going to be negative 2 into 2 cubed. We're plugging it in to the equation of the original cubic function. We need to have this added with, I think it's 6x uh, squared. We have 18 x and we also have 10 at the end. I don't know if they're all pluses. So let's just confirm and make sure that everything is copied quite well. Yes, except the a value, everything is positive. So 6x squared, positive 18x and positive 10 right at the end. Okay, so once you have that, all you need to do is just make sure that you sub that two value wherever you see x in your calculator, making sure you don't mess up the signs like we said and the number is the correct one. You end up with a y value of 52. So it means the coordinates at the point of contact are 2 to 52. That's where these guys meet each other. Four and uh, 54 and 2. All right. Now, I'm missing the gradient because I need to use y's mx plus c to find the equation of my line, right? So since I've got this, where will I get the gradient? Well, it turns out that the derivative is also the formula for working out gradient at one point. So what do we know about the gradient? Well, we know that if we work out the derivative, we are going to find what the gradient is going to be. Let's do it here at the top, okay? Uh, the derivative of this function, we found it as negative 6x squared. We got 12x and we got 18 at the end. That's what we found as the derivative when you're deriving the function. Uh, yes, it's going to be negative 6x squared plus 12x plus 18. Now, we want the derivative when x is 2. So we're going to have to sub 2, just sub 2 here, to work out the gradient when x is equal to 2. Very basic calculation. Make sure you just sub that in your calculator. If you sub that in the calculator, you should have uh, the solution as the y value of what we have over there. Uh, I think if my math is correct, we should end up with the number 18. I think it makes sense. This is 12 times 2, which is 24. This is 6 times four, which is 24, so we're just ending up with a gradient of 18. Now the equation is y is mx plus c, all right, what is my y? y is the point of contact, it's 54, uh, m is 18, uh, x is 2, uh, c is unknown, all right? It's positive, that tells you that the line is increasing, I'm happy to see that. The product between 18 and 2 is going to be uh, what you will subtract from 54. So if you take 54 and you minus that 18 times 2, you should get what the C value is going to be, and it turns out it's also going to be 18. So it turns out if you multiply 18 by 2, you get 36, and if you double that, you're always going to get what you're looking at over there. So 54 minus 18, and that 18 has to be a double. You end up with a C value of 18. So 18 becomes our C there for the equation of this tangent is going to be Y equals to the gradient 18X plus the C value, which is 18, and this is pretty awesome. All right, moving on to the next question. Ah, there's another one. For which values of x will f be concave down? What is the meaning of that? Concave down is what we're looking at here. This graph begins by being concave up. Okay, concave up if it does this, but there's a point where it's going to change concavity and it is gonna be concave down. Now, they want you to find the x value where the graph is going to be concave down. Now that happens immediately after what we call the point of inflection. And I know we know how to work out the point of inflection. I can do it in five different ways, but I'll just show you that you can just take the second derivative and that second derivative, put it for concave down, put it less than zero. So derive twice, put it less than zero, you'll get the x value where this is concave down. Alternatively, if you're looking for those coordinates, the x coordinate at the point of inflection, it's just the x1 plus x2 of the turning point. If you take the average of the turning point, you're going to get the x value of the point of inflection. Okay, so let's take what x values we found. We found that one x value of the turning point is negative 1. We found that the other one is a 3. And if you divide this by 2, you're going to get that this graph changes concavity when x is 1. So let's go back and check what I'm talking about on the drawing. 
you'll see that apparently when x is 1, the graph will change from being concave up to being concave. So we are looking for these x values, which are this side. That's where the graph is basically concave down. And that happens from an x value of 1. Okay, how do I do that? I said you take this x here and the x at a, which we found it as 3, you average them. Between them, you're going to get the x value of the point of inflection. Okay, awesome stuff. So that means after 1, the graph is concave down. After 1, the graph is going to be concave down. Okay, so let's go back and write that. Concave down, therefore the solution is going to be all x values that are after 1. The graph is going to be concave down. Okay, uh, now this one is always a challenge. Find x values where x multiplied by the derivative is greater than 0. Okay, analysis. Now, look at those two things. First of all, we are multiplying two things there. I want to actually highlight that. We are multiplying two things. We've got x multiplied by the derivative is greater than 0. This x is literally x from the x-axis. On the x-axis, that's what this x is actually all about, right? And this part here is asking you about the gradient. So we're talking about the gradient of the graph, which is what the derivative tells you about the, the, the graph, okay? Now, if you want to multiply two things, I'm trying to multiply two things here, and it says greater than zero, and I want my answer to come out greater than zero, which means I want it to come out positive. So you ask yourself a simple question. What are the contents that I need here for me to get a product that is going to be greater than zero, AKA positive, not that AKA, this one, okay. So for me to get a product that is going to be positive, I need these things to both be positive times positive. So I need the x-axis to be positive and the gradient to also be positive. So if I label this and say this is the x-axis part and this is the gradient part, I need both of them to be positive for me to get a positive gradient, um, I mean positive product. Now how do you work that out? You need this where the x-axis is positive, which means on my Cartesian plane, I need to look at the parts that are on the right of the Cartesian plane. So this is where x is positive, beautiful people. So in this region of the x-axis, okay, that's the x-axis, and this is the y-axis. I want the positive part of the x-axis. I, mean, I have to look there. And what must be happening there? That's where I need to look at where the gradient of the graph is positive. And the gradient of the graph is positive if the graph is increasing, okay? So which means my graph has to be going up and as it goes up, we have to be on the positive side of the x-axis. And if you go back to our cubic, you'll agree with us that our cubic was increasing and it started turning at some point here to start to decrease. We don't want that part. We want to know where was it increasing on the positive side of the x-axis. And it was increasing from zero all the way until the x value of the turning point, which we found as three. So the solution for this region is all x values that are smaller than 3, but greater than 0. Because in that region, both the x-axis is positive and the graph has a gradient that is positive because it is going, it is going up. The second part where I can achieve this result is you want to multiply two things, you want to get the answer that is positive. When can that be? That can happen if they're both negative. So negative and negative. So big question, what is the first part? Is the x-axis. Where are we looking now? We're looking on the negative part of the x-axis. I want the x-axis to be negative, and I want my graph to be decreasing because we said the part that is second refers to the gradient, and the gradient is negative if your graph is going down. And if you go back to the drawing, you'll see that the graph comes and bounces here and starts going up. We don't want where it's going up. We want where it's going down. And we know that it stopped decreasing at the point where x is negative 1. So all these x values on the left, the x-axis is negative, and the graph is decreasing as well. So the solution will be all x values before negative 1. And that will be the solution to this very beautiful question. This will be the answers, the top part, where we say x is between 0 and 3. And the second part is all the x values that are smaller than 1. We will achieve what we are interested in. Okay, cool. So now the last part is pretty easy, but is super confusing. Particularly if you don't know your story when it comes to uh, application concept. They're saying to us here, BT is, a parallel, is, is parallel to the x-axis. We need to prove that the area of the triangle RBT is less than four square units. So we're going to go and try and find out triangle RBT and prove that the area will be smaller than four. Okay, where is RBT? Now look at that, RBT. There's no triangle yet. 
so we can forge one. Remember, you can't get a triangle if you're looking at the line B out as a curve. But if I try to join them with a straight line and join here and join back here, we've got a nice awesome area here, okay? So we want to prove that this area is going to be smaller than four. Now, how can you do that? Well, uh, we don't have a formula for calculating. We can calculate the area of this, but it's going to be complicated because we need to do a lot of uh, trigonometry and we don't want to go uh, through that route. So we can cheat our way by doing this. Just extend this and go perpendicular down and extend this and form the green triangle. Let's focus on the green triangle. I'm, I'm sure you guys will agree with me that the green triangle is bigger than the yellow triangle. So I'm just going to try and work out what the area of the green triangle is. And if you guys may allow us, we're just going to put it here so that you can look at what we have so far. Now, the area of the green triangle is going to be something pretty simple. According to what we know, we know that the area of a triangle, the big one, the green triangle, is going to be half base multiplied by the perpendicular height. That's why I'm saying draw the line BR straight down. Half is a number. The base of the green triangle is the distance from T to where that perpendicular line is. And I think you'll agree with me that we are moving left. From point T going to be, you're going to move two units left because R is directly above the perpendicular line. So you moved this distance here going that way is just two units in unit form. Don't worry about the negative sign. Distance is not negative. So the base of the triangle is going to be two. The height is the distance from T going up. Now, what is the coordinates of T here? T is uh, 0 is to 10. It's the y-intercept of both graphs. And you'll see here that the y-value has to be 10. Even the straight line says the same story. Those 10 values tell you that's where the graph cuts the y-axis. It's 10. So now I'm moving from 10, I'm going up. How many moves am I making? Going from 10 to 14, I'm making 4 units. All right? From 10 to 14, you're moving up, you're making 4 units. So the height of my triangle is going to be 4. So half of 2 is 1. 1 times 4 is going to give us 4 square units. Now, if the green triangle has an area of 4 square units and the triangle inside is smaller, the yellow one is smaller, I'm sure you guys can see that this is a much smaller triangle than the first one. Clearly, then we can clearly see that uh, triangle uh, BRT is less than 4 uh, square units because uh, the area of a triangle that has got four square units happens to be bigger than this triangle that they are talking about. Very awesome question, absolutely, absolutely exciting, showing you how you can integrate all the concepts you've learned, even when you're integrating stuff such as what you've learned when you were doing measurements. We're coming back with more. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Did you know that one-fifth of the world's fresh water is in a single lake? Lake Baikal in eastern Siberia is the oldest freshwater lake on Earth, originating some 25 million years ago. It is also the world's largest volume of fresh water, some 23,000 cubic kilometers of it, which means that Lake Baikal contains about one-fifth of all the fresh water on the planet.
Welcome back. Welcome back, Ten Folders, and thank you for staying with us on a show that is proudly brought to you with lots of love by Liberty. We are doing with the medics a vision of paper one, focusing specifically on those hard questions that people always avoid. And thank you guys for sending them through to us. You want to know how you can send your question? Go to your app store and look for our app. We call it the Tenfold Education app. Beyond allowing you to send questions, you can stream this show live using this awesome app. And you can also uh, be able to send questions to us. And also watch a lot of awesome videos that will help you with the content that we're using as we're trying to answer all these questions. Perhaps you also want access to uh, very awesome uh, past papers that you can use. Go to WhatsApp and send us a greeting. While you are there, we will give you all those questions and quickly jump to your status message and upload that. Tell people that Tenfold Life is up and running and they're missing if they're not watching the program. In addition to that, go to YouTube, guys. We've got a lot of resources. Videos covering anything and everything you are interested in. I promise you we've got all this uh, in, our, in our YouTube channel. Like those videos and share them with your friends. Let them know that we've got all that and subscribe to our channel as well. All right, so let's go to our next question, which was sent to us by Treasure Vuma. It's an awesome question based on a cubic graph, not the traditional one that you've seen before. You don't want to miss out on how to approach this one. Let's go and check it out. All right, so this is question eight, and it reads as follows. It says the following information about a cubic polynomial, y equals to f of x, is given. So there's a whole list of bullet points, f of negative 1 is 0, f of 2 is 0, all the way up to the point where it says if x is smaller than 0, then the derivative is going to be greater than 0. Okay, first question is asking us to use the information uh, to draw a neat sketch graph of f using the grid on the diagram sheet. Okay, we don't have a diagram sheet in this case, but that's going to be um, doable without a diagram sheet. We'll see how to work with this. All right. Now, let's go to all our bullet points and analyze them one by one. Now, I want you to listen to this very carefully, grade 12s, very carefully. Anything you see inside the brackets is always x. First of all, we know that this is going to be a cubic polynomial. It's a cubic, so that means the defining equation is of this form ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. We know that this is what it looks like. And if you had to factor this, it will give you three brackets, okay? I'm already trying to prepare you for what's going to happen. So that's how a cubic polynomial looks, and it always produces three factors. Now, if I go back to the bullet points on the left, anything you see inside the brackets is always x, and anything you see outside the brackets would always be your y. So what we're looking at is when x is negative 1, the polynomial will have a y value of 0. That means I can immediately start putting points and say the graph passes to the point negative 1 and 0, the graph passes to the point 2 and 0, and the graph passes to the point 1 and negative 4. Okay, let's erase that. Okay, very important. So anything inside is going to be your x-intercept, and anything that is outside will always be your y value. Now, f of 1 comes up with a value of negative 4. Okay, that's another point where the graph is going to, look, uh, to pass. Now, I think you guys will agree with me that the first two points are talking to us, about something or awesome, which is called the x-intercept. All right. The, set, the, the fourth bullet point says f of 0 is negative 2. Like I said, if you continue, uh, x is 0. The number inside the bracket is always your x, and the one outside is the corresponding y-coordinate, which is going to be negative 2. Okay, well, that's, that's as far as the graph is, is, uh, is, goes, as far as those four are, are concerned. Now, you'll notice that the, sec, the, the last three bullet points are now talking about the derivative. Now, the derivative gives you the gradient of the graph. The derivative gives you the gradient of the graph, okay? That's gradient, very important. So if this is about the gradient, I don't know, let's put it this side. Put it this side, that these ones now are discussing the gradient. And when we're talking gradient, we're talking increases, decreases for the parts such as greater than zero and greater than zero. And we're also talking where is the gradient equal to zero. Now, the next point, the first one of those three says, the derivative at 1 is the same as the derivative at negative 1, and it is going to give you a value of 0. That means when x is 1, our gradient is 0. And when x is negative 1, our gradient is 0. And what do we know about the gradient? We know that if we assume that our graph is going to look like this, it means the turning point is going to happen when x is negative 1 with whatever y value, and the other turning point is going to happen when x is 1 and whatever the y value going to have. 
So that part you have over there is discussing the story of turning points because at the turning point, the derivatives, aka the gradients, are all going to be equal to zero, okay? The shape might be the other way around. We're going to discuss that just now. It could be the way we have or it could be the other way around. Bottom line is at the turning point here, x is negative 1. We don't know what y is. And here at the turning point, the other x value is 1. We don't know what the y value is. It could be one of those two. We're still going to come and explain to you which one of the two is going to be the correct version of what we're looking at. The second last bullet point says, now think about this. It says before negative 1, the derivative is greater than 0. What does that mean in simple English? It means the gradient is positive. And the gradient is positive if a graph is increasing, which means the graph is going up. So apparently, before x is negative 1, the graph was just going up until it got to negative 1 where it stopped. Now you can clearly see that between the two versions, let's look at our graphs from left to right. This one, you can see that the graph is increasing. The graph is going up before negative 1. It's increasing. That, is, uh, that corresponds to gradient greater than 0. It's going up. And then this one, the second graph, says before on the left of negative 1, my graph was decreasing, which is a violation of that statement. That says the derivative, a.k.a. the gradient, is positive, a.k.a. graph is going up before negative 1. So if the graph must go up, up before negative 1, it means this can't be a version of this graph. So the shape is going to look like this one. All right? Very important. Quickly, let's have that down. Okay, so I'm going to immediately start hoeing the graph here. Sorry for that. Uh, if you put it here, you're going to have something that looks like this, okay? That's how the shape of the graph is going to look. Because at negative 1 here, my graph was going up, according to the statement that we give it. The last bullet point says, before 1, the derivative is greater than 0, okay? I think that's actually very interesting because it's going to cause problems here. We can't have the graph increasing before 1 and have the graph increasing again before um, zero, uh, before one as well, because we said it's increasing before negative one. So we can't have it increasing again. It is supposed to say after one, the graph is increasing again. So not before, so I think this is a typing error. It should say after one, because a cubic graph will increase, decrease for a moment, and increase again. So that's what I'm actually expecting to get. Okay, cool. Now, something very important about negative one is the fact that um, uh, negative one appears twice. You will notice, Gritov, if you go back, to this negative 1, I'm going to highlight it in blue. The point where x is negative 1 is to 0 is a point in the graph where the graph cuts the x-axis. But that point is also the point where the graph is turning. And where is that happening? It's also happening here. You'll see that at negative 1, the gradient is also equal to 0. So that means that negative 1 is a very special point. It is what we call the bouncing point of our graph. That means our Cartesian plane has to pass here at negative 1 is to 0. It is an x-intercept. At the same time, it's where the graph cuts uh, the x-axis. It's a turning point and an x-intercept at the same time. We have it at the turning point, negative 1 is to 0, and we also have it as the x-intercept. So it has to be a bouncing point. It satisfies those two conditions at the same time. All right, then the other turning point is obviously happening when x is 1. We don't know what the y-coordinate is going to be. We can discuss that at some point. We were told this, according to the examiner, we were told that when x is there it is, I'm going to highlight it in green. In green. When x is 1, the y value has to be negative 4. Okay, so when x is 1, the y value has to be negative 4. Right, 1 and negative 4, be happy with that. Negative 1 and 0, we've got that. We are happy with what we have on the board right now. Uh, the x-intercept here was also given as another value. The examiner said it's also going to cut x here at 2. When x is 2, that's where the graph is going to pass. So we're going to have 2 is to 0 as another point here. Right, and what else was given the y-intercept? This is the y-axis. I'm sure you can see that the, there's a point where it says um, it's going to pass at the point where x is 0, y will be negative 2. That's the y-intercept, is this part here. Okay, the y-intercept is going to be negative 2. Let's put that down. It means we're going to have negative 2 here, and that's the last part that we could put here to have an awesome graph, which is our cubic function with all those awesome features that you guys have here. Okay. Uh, the follow-up part says for which values of x is f strictly decreasing. So where's the graph decreasing? You can see that the graph is decreasing from here, going all the way until we get to here. It's decreasing here. It's from x is negative 1 until x is positive. So it's strictly decreasing 
for that interval from negative 1 until positive 1. So our solution for this is going to be all x values smaller than negative 1 but greater. Uh, smaller than 1 but greater than negative 1. So between negative 1 and 1, the graph was strictly going down. Use your graph to determine the x coordinate to the point of inflection. Point of inflection is where the graph changes concavity. Like I said, you can use your graph. Beautiful people, what do you know? We know that this is what, what is happening. The x here is 1. I don't care about y. The x here is, um, what is it? The x here is it's 1. I think this one is negative 1. Yes, negative 1 and 1. The y is 0 here and the y here is negative 4. Now, if you want to find the point of inflection, it is where the graph changes concavity. And I promise you that that point is exactly in the middle of those two points. So if you want the x value of the point of inflection, it's the average of the x values from your turning points divided by 2. So it's minus 1 added with 1 over 2. So we're going to get that it's going to be at an x value of 0. Similarly, the same thing applies with the y values. The point of inflection is exactly between the y values of a turning point. So y1 plus y2 over 2 is going to give us uh, 0. Take away 4 divided by 2. So that's negative 4 over 2, which gives us negative 2. So it turns out that the graph changes concavity at the point where 0 is the x value and y is negative 2. And if you go back to our beautiful drawing, I'm sure you guys will agree with me that that is happening at this point here which is, it looks fair that it's going to happen at the point where x is 0 and y has a value of uh, negative 2. Absolutely awesome question, very nice indeed. Uh, it's not complicated. We're going to come back with um, the last question. So this is how you would handle this one. We're now going to think about what we could do maybe for uh, the remaining time of our show to try and make sure we also help you to understand what more you could do when you're working with this stuff. Remember, we are very much interested in helping you to understand how do you analyze geometry questions, uh, how do you analyze uh, uh, calculus questions, how do you analyze, you send a lot of calculus questions that are challenging. Uh, I hope this session has helped you to see how do you basically work with these awesome questions that you have there. So um, the next one is also based on calculus. It seems like you guys are very interested in uh, looking more at differential calculus. Uh, it says to us here, question 10, it comes from C Kue. Uh, the tangent to the curve of g of x is 2x cubed plus px squared plus qx minus 7 at x equals to 1 has the equation y equals to 5x minus 8. Okay, show that the point 1 is to negative 3 is a point of contact between these two graphs. Okay, how do you do that? Well, pretty basic. You've got the cubic graph. It's got an a value that is positive. That means it's going to look like this. At some point here, there's going to be an x value uh, of, I think, I don't know where it is, we can just roughly say at a point where x is 1. They're telling you that they meet when x is 1. So you want to find what the corresponding y value is going to be. Now, since they are both passing through that point, you can use either equation of the two. You either use the cubic or use a straight line and try and find what the y value is going to be. The cubic is useless in this case because we don't know what p and q are, so I can't use it but I can take the one and sub it here where you see x. So I'm just going to say y is going to be 5 into the x value we are given, and then we have to not add but take away 8, and that gives you a y value of negative 3. So yes, examiner, we agree with you. They meet each other when x is 1 and y equals 2, negative 3. Last question says hands. Hands means use the above information somehow. Use the above information. Or otherwise, if you're smarter, use something else. Calculate the value of P and Q. Now, P and Q are on the cubic graph, so I don't have a choice. I need to use that. So let's go back to the cubic and write it down. We know the cubic is Y equals to um, something here. What is it? It's actually 2X cubed. Okay, 2X cubed. I think it's plus PX squared plus QX minus 7. Okay, plus PX squared plus QX minus 7. We've got that, right? We know that this graph passes a point with coordinates 1 and negative 3. I can just slot those here. 1 cubed, P into 1 squared, 1 minus 7. X is 1 at that point. And if you simplify this, that's a 2, okay? Uh, and that is a negative 7. So if you add 7 on both sides, you're going to have a 7. And subtract 2 on both sides, and that minus 3 is still there. You end up with P plus Q. I think that's 7 minus 2, which is 5 minus 2. Uh, it's just 7 minus 5 people, which is going to give you 2 is the sum of P and Q. We have an equation of P and Q, but still not conclusive. We need another equation to try and figure out 
what the solution to this is going to be. Now you go back to the graph, go back to it and ask, what more can I do? Well, we know that the gradient, now look at this, the gradient of the tangent is five, okay? But the gradient is equivalent to the derivative, beautiful people. If you didn't know the derivative is the gradient of the cubic. The gradient of this and the gradient of this are equal at the point of contact. They are equal at that point. So I just need to equate the derivative to that five. What is my gradient? My gradient according to this is equals to six x squared plus two px plus q. So what we have is the formula for the gradient of the cubic. That gradient, you can just quickly put that equal to five because at the point of contact, the gradient, which is the derivative of the cubic will be equal to the gradient of the straight line, which was given to us as five. So six x squared plus two px plus q. Six x squared plus two px plus q must be equal to five. But this gradient is five when x equals to one. So I can plug that one over there. I'll get six into one squared. I'll get two p into one at q. We have five. That's six. So what do you have? You have two p plus q equals to negative one when you subtract six on both sides. So now I've got two equations, beautiful guys. Um, one of them is two equals to, yeah, let's write them this way, p plus q equals to two. The other one says two p uh, plus q equals to negative one. That's what I end up with. If you uh, solve these simultaneously, which you guys should be good at, by subtracting the equations, I get negative p when I take the top one minus the bottom one equals to three. So p equals to three. And if I've got p as three, I'm sure you can see that putting that back is gonna give you a q value of exactly negative one. And those will be the values of p and q, which is basically what the examiner was asking us for. Because I think you will agree with me that, oh, p minus two p will be negative p, two minus minus is gonna be plus, so it's gonna be negative here. If you've got negative p minus three, it's gonna be five, not this, it's gonna be plus five. Yes, I think this is basically what the solution is going to be. All right, uh, very awesome question. I'm gonna show that it's proudly brought to you by Liberty. A very big shout out to Liberty. A big shout out to you guys for joining us and sending us all those questions. And also a special shout out to our production team. We're still going to come back with more questions. Make sure you join our revision sessions. We love you, we love you tenfold. Until we meet again next time, bye-bye. Welcome to Moby School. We are here to make sure that you, yes, you get all the marks that you deserve on the go. We're here every Monday to Fridays from 2 to 3 p.m. only on Mindset Learn TV. Now, this is a whole hour worth of revision just for you. And I hope that you've got your notepads and your pens ready and that you and your study group are game for today's revision session. Now, my name is Joe, and just like you, I'm also in metric, and I'm here for a whole hour to make sure that I ace my final exams. 
and I hope that you will be doing the exact same thing. Now, do remember that we love hearing from you guys. So log on to our Facebook page, which is www.facebook.com forward slash Moby School SA. Drop us your comments, like our page, um, share the page, and even spread the Moby School family even bigger. Now, isn't that cool? Yep. Yes, it is. Now, do remember that you can catch us here for a whole hour of revision session where all of our awesome teachers come right here to help you guys revise. So on that note of the first revision session, let's head straight to our teacher. Macbeth, Act 4, Scene 3. This is what is called the king's evil or the evil and we think that it was a kind of TB. Now it's called the king's evil because people believed that a king being appointed by God had the gift of healing. And this was something that, that really doctors couldn't deal with at the time. So you would go to the king and he would lay his hands on you and you would be healed. Okay, so it is a long scene, but remember that Shakespeare's plays have been divided into scenes by various people over the years, and we can think of this as in three sections, all right? That's the first one. So Macduff comes to Malcolm. Malcolm doesn't trust him. Then we hear about Edward, who's described as holy and good, And then the news comes that Macduff's wife and children are dead. And Malcolm says, actually, I do have an army and I'm about to go back to Scotland. So we're in England and we're at the king's palace. So Macduff has come to England he wants Malcolm to go with him back to Scotland in order to defeat Macbeth. But this is what has been going on in the past. So because Macbeth has been trying to get Malcolm back to Scotland so that he can kill him, Malcolm doesn't trust Macduff. Then we get the news. So really, it becomes very, very urgent. An army must go back to Scotland. Order must be restored in Scotland. It's just everything is worse and worse. All right, so weary is quite a good word here. Be careful, not weary. Weary is tired. Weary, he is weary of Macduff. Why? One, is he, he doesn't understand why Macduff has left his family because they're unprotected. So he's thinking, hang on, if Macduff has left his family, either they're hostages, in which case Macduff is trying to betray me, or Macduff is working with Macbeth, in which case Macduff is trying to betray me. And it's not until Macduff rejects Malcolm. He says, no, you're going to be worse than Macbeth that Malcolm finally trusts Macduff. So what do we understand about Macduff? This is my interpretation. I'm giving you words like this. These two words basically mean the same thing. He wants Malcolm to come back to England. So when Malcolm accuses himself of terrible things, he says, I'm avaricious, I'm greedy, I'm lascivious, I like lots of sex and lots of women. He accuses himself of all sorts of things. Each time Macduff makes an excuse and says, oh no, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine. And of course Malcolm doesn't trust him because he's saying terrible things about himself and Macduff is going, that's okay, don't worry, we'll be able to sort this. And eventually Malcolm just says, I'm going to be the worst possible king, I'm the most evil king, I'm worse than Macbeth. And at that point Macduff says, no, don't want you. And at that point, Malcolm trusts Macbeth because, sorry, trusts Macduff because Macduff rejects him completely. He says terrible things about him and he denounces him. He, uh, he 
criticizes him to his face. Then we have the grief. All right, so what are we saying about Macduff? In an exam, I don't want you to say something like Macduff is stupid. He should have realized. So use a word rather like naive, meaning he hasn't realized. He hasn't seen into the depth of evil in Macbeth. But he didn't mean for his family to be killed. And this is how he responds to the news of his family's death. So it's through Malcolm's words. He doesn't speak, but Malcolm says, Merciful heaven, what man ne'er pull your hat upon your brows. Now what usually happens is they put Macduff in a hoodie, because you don't really want him in a hat, and your brow is your forehead. You don't really want him pulling a hat over his head. It would make him look silly. But if he's wearing a hoodie, you can see how he would pull that hood over his face in grief. He kind of turns inward in agony. So that's how we know how the actor responds. He pulls whatever is over his head across his face. And Malcolm says to him, speak your sorrow. You, your, your heart is burdened with grief. It'll break if you don't express the grief. So Macduff is genuinely devastated by the news of his family's murder. Then Malcolm says to Macduff, be comforted. We will take revenge. We will cure this deadly grief. So the medicine will be fighting against Macbeth. Look for images of medicine so, and sickness. So Macbeth is going to be described as the sickness of Scotland. And this army coming in is the cleansing, cleaning, purifying medicine for Scotland. This is Macduff. It's unclear who this he is. This he could be Malcolm. Malcolm has just said to him, don't, don't be grief-stricken, don't cry, be angry, take your revenge. So that he could be Malcolm. Malcolm doesn't have children. Malcolm doesn't understand. He'd never say something like that if he were a father. I'm a father. I know how it feels. Or that he could be Macbeth. He doesn't have children. Then here, Macduff would be saying, only a man without children could kill another man's children because he doesn't understand fully what he's doing. This is a reference to his wife and his children, that all of them are dead. This is Macbeth. Now, we've talked about the falcon as a bird of prey. A kite is another bird of prey. So think of a bird with that fierce beak and the talons. And he says... Macbeth is this bird of prey that comes out of hell. And then all again, look at this. This is this terrible sense of loss. All my pretty chickens, my children, and their dam, their mother, at one fell swoop. Now, a bird of prey, as you know, goes high up into the sky, and it, it hovers, and it looks down on its prey, and then it comes down, ramp! onto the rabbit or whatever it is that it's going to um, eat. That fell, that's that coming down, wham, and it basically kills it. It'll break its back as it hits it. And so at one fell swoop is the way that a bird of prey swoops down from the sky onto the creature that it's going to attack and kill. And this is when Malcolm is... I suppose quite insensitive. He says, fight your grief like a man. So men do not cry. Men do not give in to grief. He says, you know, man up here. And Mal Macduff turns on Malcolm and says, I shall do so. I will be a man, but I must feel it as a man. I have to cry. Why? I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. So it's a wonderful moment when Macduff says, to be a man. 
I will cry. It is not unmanly to cry. This is my wife and my children. They've all been murdered. I will cry because I am a man and I have feelings. And then I will be angry and then I will kill Macbeth. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? There's that moment where I think we understand that he feels angry with God. Did heaven look on? Did God look down from heaven and see what was happening and did nothing? And then he turns on himself. He says, it's my fault, naught, naught that I am, nothing that I am, nor for their own demerits, but for mine fell slaughter on their souls. I am nothing, and for me they were murdered.